Hello, hello, testing, testing. If you don't mind uh, raising your hand, if you can hear me. Oh, excellent. Okay. And let me set go. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back. Let's just have a quick peek who's here. Okay, excellent. All right, everyone's coming in. So as uh, as people are filing in, let's just go over a few little uh, things I wanted to wrap up real quick. And then we'll get into the continuation of the class. Um, I do have to apologize that uh, I, I've been falling behind a little bit on my uh, slides presentations, so um, I'm just <laughs> reusing some uh, slides at this point. But we're basically going to be focusing on a lot of coding now, as this is a crash course and a fast-paced kind of um, introduction to programming, which will hopefully give you guys a good feel of what it's all about. So um, hold on tight fasten your seat belts and uh, try to follow along as best as you can. I'm going to definitely try and discuss and explain things as best as I can. Um, so just a little thing or two. A little wrap up about CSS. I'm going to Google something called CSS grid. And the first link that comes up is from this awesome website about CSS called CSS Tricks. I highly recommend you guys frequent that website. Check out their articles. They have some good advice, some good stuff going on over there. How to figure out some good ways how to do things in CSS. How do people usually do certain techniques in CSS? So go ahead and uh, have a look on that website. And I'm going to specifically quickly just scroll through this particular page that has to do with the CSS grid. Um, is it this one? I'm not sure it's actually this one. They have some good graphics though, so that's maybe a good start. The idea that I'm trying to bring up here about CSS grid is this idea that when you're making a web page and you're designing sections of the page and this belongs here and this belongs there, um, we do need to have some way, how do you make like a box for this stuff that remains here? And how do I put that stuff down there? And how do I put this stuff to the right and this stuff to the left? How is that stuff done in CSS? And back in the, in the bad old days, um, people were using tables all the time. And they would make table, tables of strange quantities of columns and strange quantities of rows and overlapping rows and overlapping columns. And this is how they would basically divide up and section out their web page so that it looks nice, it looks presentable. But behind the scenes, in terms of the semantic HTML usage, it was a, it was a mess. Not every web page is a chart. Not every web page is a table of data. But that's how people were incorrectly using things uh, in, uh, when building their pages. They were using tables all over the place. So then a little bit further down the line, people started making use of div for generically dividing and sectioning out parts of your web page. And they would style it with CSS. But that was even that is still the bad old days. And now we have some awesome, awesome, awesome new stuff coming out, which just came out in the past few years. In fact, it's so recent. It's not even that recent per se, but it's recent enough that I'm not even fully familiar with it. There's these awesome grid things you can do. There's gap, there's grid gap, there's column 
There is all sorts of things you can do here with CSS, which magically just transform the sections of your page and lay it out exactly how you want, what you want, how you want. And there's another awesome technology in CSS called uh, Flex, CSS Flex. And we're probably also going to see a complete guide to Flexbox also from the website CSS Tricks. Very good website, highly recommended. And here we have a few more graphics to, to explain this concept. So again, what this is trying to solve is how do you put things around your page the way and the location and in the position where you want them to be? You know, you want to have a section on the right, a section on the left, and a section in the middle, and things over them and things under them. How do you make that kind of uh, calculation? If someone has a large screen, if someone has a small screen, should things kind of stack up and then go to the next line, or should they not do that? Should it be columns? How exactly do you want to arrange things on your page is a big question that every one of us deals with in, in making web pages all the time. And there used to be some bad answers about that, like tables and divs with a lot of uh, margins and, and all sorts of hackery. You had to kind of work your way around uh, your head sort of thing to make the kind of arrangement that you wanted to make. But now they have the most magical solutions ever. You have CSS grid systems, CSS columns, CSS flex box. And between all of those, you can arrange and you can make any and every kind of arrangement that you want your elements to be in easily, smoothly. And there are some great tutorials over here on this website that explain uh, exactly how you do this and demonstrate here. You see, this is how this stuff is going to stack up one next to each other side by side. But if you resize the window and you make it go narrower, so now look how it's going to stack up. The top row is going to have the more of them. The lower row is going to have only two of them. And they're going to allow some space in between each other. So they're not really spacing justified, a kind of spacing center with this amount of gap between them, et cetera, et cetera. You can customize this exactly how you envision it, how your design needs to be. And it all works magically. Whereas back in the day, I can't even tell you guys how hard it used to be to make your web page behave and have this kind of layout and arrangement uh, back in the bad old days of just divs and, and, and the old CSS. And, um, and even worse than, you know, behind that, so we used to use tables and all that. But here it's beautiful, it's amazing. You, you, you stack things up when they get down to mobile size or you spread them out into different bars when they're wide enough. It's, it's a beautiful world now and you guys, really, really need to go through tutorials learning how to do grids and flexbox in CSS. And just one last word about frameworks. Um, back in the day when we used to have to do a lot of uh, CSS hacking around to make layout, layouts look nice, look how we want them to look, um, some people put together a bunch of ge general solutions that is useful for different people, like you want to make things stacked up on top of each other, you want to make things into columns, People gather together a bunch of solutions and put them in one CSS file or several CSS files, and they call that like a framework. They call it a library. It's the kind of thing where you can basically just copy paste and use that library, use that, uh, that bunch of stuff that people already put together, and you plug it into your website. And now you have a bunch of easy stuff that you could use that you don't even have to hack around with CSS so much. You can just add a few HTML classes inside, inside of a few elements. And it's going to automatic, automatically or automatically uh, arrange things the way you want them to be. And one of these very famous uh, frameworks out there, these libraries that you can use until today, if you find it necessary, is one called Bootstrap. Bootstrap CSS. You can Google that. CSS Bootstrap. This is basically what it all boils down to is you have this... Um, Let's see how, uh, where is the get start here? Getting started is always a good place to get started. What it all boils down to is you just have to put one of these things inside of your head, the head of your HTML. You put in a link with a, uh, with a href to basically be pulling in a CSS file from out there on the internet. And it's going to bring in a whole bunch of CSS into your website that you didn't even have to work hard for. You didn't even have to type it out. You're using a bunch of work that other, other people graciously put together and put out there for public for everyone to use. And you just bring it into your website and now suddenly your website is turbocharged to do a lot of cool effects very, very easily. Once you did already, hang on, I think I'm on the old version 
of CSS. Yeah, I'm, no, I'm on the old version of Bootstrap over here. This is Bootstrap version three, something or other. Scrolling up to the top over here, it's saying, do you, are you looking for Bootstrap four? That's the most latest version. There we go. Okay, Bootstrap number four. This is the one we're looking for. Uh, getting started. Here we go. You can just put, put in this uh, link element over here that belongs in the head of your document. Just put it in with the rel style sheet, the href pulling in the file from somewhere on the internet, a few more attributes over there to assure integrity and security and stuff like that. Um, there is even some JavaScript associated with it if you want to do some other cool effects and other things that Bootstrap offers. But basically what this gives you is a whole bunch of cool stuff that you can do on your website easily to make a lot of effects happen quickly without you having to hack things around. If you want to make a website, for example, that has this kind of layout, it has a header on top, you can click on this uh, sandwich button over here, it pops up something on top, you have a heading, you have a center, you know, jumbotron main section on top with a few buttons, then you scroll further down below and you have three of these cards over here. If you want to make a layout like this, you can just go straight into the documentation over here and look around and see, okay, how do I make the uh, layout for such a thing? So they start teaching you. you. You can use this class. Just add this class to some of your elements in your HTML, and boom, automatically you're going to start having your areas and sections in your web page starting to appear in the correct kinds of ways that you want them to show up. Here's how you use the grid system. You can make three columns, one next to each other. Here's how you do it. Make this kind of HTML, put in these classes, in the outer element, this put this class in the inner element, put this class over here, that class over there, and boom, it's going to work magically. You didn't even have to write a single line of CSS code. You didn't have to negotiate with uh, why is this not working and why is that not working. You just put some classes in your HTML and the bootstrap library automatically did things for you. You can make things in different sizes. You can prepare your website to be ready for different screen sizes. If people are browsing your website on, the, on a desktop browser or if they're browsing it on small and extra small on a mobile device, whatever it is, you can make this arrangement, that arrangement, the other arrangement wider and which one has more priority and which one pushes more into which and which one is the main one and which one should go under the other one if the space is too small, et cetera, et cetera. You have all of this stuff over here to make different kinds of layouts and arrangements of how you want your, your web page to look. And that's just the layouts over here. There's so many other sections over here of different things that you can do, how to make a nice looking form where people submit pieces of information in a Dropbox and a text input and a checkbox. And it looks more nice and presentable than if you just tried, uh, you know, hacking out your own CSS or if you tried kind of just using plain HTML. This already gives it some style, some kind of appearance that at least looks slightly more presentable than nothing. And then, you know, from there, it could make things a lot more easier to in, in, implement a specific design that you might be working towards. Um, how to make images appear in different ways. You know, images can be tricky. Do you want images to be part of the text, breaking in line, or should it be in front of the text? Or should the text go around it? Should it be to one side, the other side, in the center, et cetera, et cetera? So many things you can do. Um, then they have components. There's tons and tons of effects and, and features that you can put in your website from, from uh, Bootstrap over here. You can make a carousel, which is basically flipping through kind of like a, a bunch of sections. Here you have a slides, slider kind of thing where you, you go to, you know, you browse to one to the other. Fancy effect that you have on websites. You have this little uh, menu thing on the bottom. Um, any different options and features. Let's go through one more. Um, let's go at navigation bars. There you go. This is like just, a, like, just as you see on top of the website itself, this Bootstrap website itself on top has a header bar with a bunch of links and it has a drop down menu and has a bunch of icons and a button. So if you want to make something nice like that yourself, like we saw on the, the, the Baby Deals website, uh, if you want to just plug and play and use Bootstrap, that will show you right over here. Here's how you can make a nav bar with the logo, the name of your website over here, and a few different links, and a drop down, and a search, bu search uh, box, and, and the search button, and everything. Just put in these elements over here, and put in these classes, and done. It's going to automatically look how you want it to look. And you can make it with this feature, that feature, the other feature, et cetera, et cetera. So I would highly recommend you guys to read up on CSS uh, columns, grid system, uh, CSS flex box system, 
and read through cssstricks.com. I'm going to put information about all this into the chat room so you guys can follow up on this uh, after the class and eventually. And also, if you guys want to plug and play existing libraries that try to make things easier for you, you can use something like Bootstrap or many other kinds of libraries that exist out there. Just Google CSS library and you'll find all sorts of different options. Bootstrap is obviously one of them, but you'll find some other ones. Pure CSS, Bulma, all sorts of different things out there. You can try them out, see what you like best. And uh, yeah, plug and play, make life easy for you. Why not? You know, if it even saves you the hassle of needing to figure out every last detail of CSS, that'll be a good start. And as you go further, you'll figure things out more. Okay, so now let's do some more of our JavaScript programming, which as we learned is uh, after having set up the elements of your page and styling them how you want them to style them with HTML being the elements and CSS just being the appearance. But otherwise the page is basically a static dead page that is what it is and that's it. JavaScript comes along and make things come alive and says, you know, puts life into it. Like, hey, it doesn't have to stay this way. If you do this, then it's gonna do that. If we can remove this and add that and make this animate and make this move around and make this browse away and do this and do that and all sorts of different things in a kind of alive kind of way so that the web page can do all sorts of activities, not just be what it is, but perform actions. That's the idea of programming with a programming language. And that's what we're learning now with JavaScript. So another thing I've been talking a lot about and Label has been talking a lot about, um, which is to catch up and uh, um, read up on a bunch of what we're learning about, the things that we don't have enough time to cover during the classes. Uh, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, we highly recommend you guys visit uh, freecodecamp.org. And over here, it looks a little bit basic. It doesn't look, uh, you know, maybe, maybe the, like the prettiest website. And also down here, going through the, the menus of all the different sections that you can learn about, it might not be fully clear. You know, I wish they maybe described it a little bit clearer. This over here, uh, don't be so scared by the description. It sounds so fancy. Responsive web design. What it basically boils down to is this is really, I'm going to just hack it away over here for a minute so we can understand this a bit clearer. The first section over here, responsive web design, is basically HTML. All about HTML, good exercises and practices and tests to see if you know all about your HTML, go into that section that's called responsive web design. Um, next. Um, oh, actually, slight correction. That section, responsive web design, is HTML and CSS. Okay, so if we go in there, we will find a bunch of other sections. And here we have, again, responsive web design certification 300 hours. Don't get too scared by that. Just open it up, open up the first section, basic HTML and HTML5, go through these exercises. It's great stuff. Here you go through the CSS exercises, great stuff. You're gonna learn step-by-step, piece-by-piece, pretty much all there is to know that's useful about HTML, CSS, uh, more things about layout and visual design, responsive, make your web page fit on different uh, screens, et cetera, et cetera. And I would highly, highly recommend you guys obviously jump into the next part, which is JavaScript algorithms and data structures certification. And here you go through the full tutorial of learning basically JavaScript, which is what we're learning now. So why don't we actually jump through a bit of that now as we're learning these concepts, let's see them through a uh, free code camp. And you know, there's a lot more specifics to read up and to uh, review and understand in, in deeper uh, with, you know, at your pace, if you wanna go through it afterwards yourself, which I'd highly recommend. But I'm just going to go quickly through a few of them, explain some things off the top of my head, and we're going to go through some of these things, hopefully a little bit quicker than what it usually takes, because there's a lot of subject matter to cover and not enough time to necessarily cover it all. So it does take some uh, additional homework time to catch up with all this. So let's start from the very beginning. Why not? Here we learn about comments. What are comments? Comments are, as you're writing a lot, a lot of JavaScript code, um, sometimes the code could seem a little cryptic. I myself sometimes look back to a project that I worked on a few weeks ago, a month or two ago, and I'm like, who in the world wrote this and what in the world was he thinking? Because it's very hard sometimes to follow up and remember what was the thought process, what's going on over here, what is even happening? It used to make sense to me when I wrote it the first time, 
but now revisiting it a while later, or if another developer, another programmer is, is having a look at it, it's hard to sometimes figure out what is even going on here, and it's good to have human explanations, human little tooltips to say, oh, this is about this, that's about that. So you can actually write uh, pieces of text in your programming codes, which the, basically the computer is going to ignore. It's just going to keep it there. I don't have to follow this instruction. Uh, I don't have to listen to this. It's just a comment for the humans to read. Normally, if you type this stuff in the programming language, like, hello, what's up? This is an explanation. Uh, and you try to run this code in the programming language, it's going to say syntax error, as you can see down here. I'm going to try to zoom in a little bit if I can. And no, apparently I cannot. I'm not sure why. Um, maybe we can do it over here. Oh, yeah, we can zoom in a little bit over here. So I, I typed in some human text over here. And down below, we could see syntax error. Unknown, unexpected token, expected, semi, blah, blah, blah. He's basically not understanding what I'm talking about. So uh, that's because he's trying to understand what I'm writing. This is a programming language. You know, you can't just say anything. You have to speak the language that the computer will understand. And this is stuff that the computer does not understand. If, however, you proceed it with two forward slashes, that tells the compiler, that, that tells the, the computer basically, um, ignore this. Just this is some text for humans to read. It's not for you to understand. If you're writing a comment like this on a single line, then you can proceed it with two forward slashes. If you want to write a comment that's lengthier and it's a full paragraph and it's maybe on multiple lines, then you can do forward slash star, write a whole bunch of text, press enter a few times, go on a few different lines, and then at the end, do the exact reverse of the opening part, kind of like opening tags and closing tags. So over here, we open it with a slash star, and now we're closing it with a star slash, and that closes off the comment. Um, okay, let's go right on to the next one. Uh, I do need to figure out a way how to skip ahead without necessarily, okay, here we go. Now we're talking about variables. This is what we started learning about next, uh, last time. In your program, you're going to have a lot of pieces of information that you need to deal with. Where are those pieces of information, and how do you hold on to them, and how do you use them? Well, there, uh, in your programming language, you have a storage room sort of thing. You have a warehouse, and you can store there a bunch of stuff. You can put stuff into boxes, and you can later change stuff that's inside of storage boxes. You can take them out. You can see what's there. You can change them. You can put them back in and put them away in storage again. And the way you do this is by typing var sum box or sum variable or whatever you want to call it. And you can put stuff inside of it, et cetera, et cetera. We started learning that last time. Moving right along. I have to click this each time. Chances are I might have to. Um, OK, now storing values with the assignment operator. We learned about that using the equal symbol you put stuff into a variable. And then you can change the stuff that's in that variable as well. You can say b equals 45, and then you're done. OK, let me try to see if I can open this in a separate page so that I don't have to keep jumping back and forth. Yeah, that works. OK. Initializing variables with the assignment operator. So you can either create a variable. OK, this is something we didn't cover exactly. Variable x. You can even either just create a box and say, have a storage box for me, please. Thank you. And that's it. That's the end of your command. Or you could say, create a storage box for me and also put inside of it something. You could do either of those. And sometimes there are different reasons why you might do one, why you might do another. Uh, you can either create a box and immediately put something inside of it or just create a variable and not put anything inside of it. And then later on, start playing around with it x equals 7, et cetera, et cetera. But you can also just create a variable and just not put anything inside of it. Next. What happens if you don't put anything inside of it? Well, uh, if you guys remember last time, we saw a few of those weird side effects. It's going to say something like null. And here he explains in more detail. In some cases, it's undefined. In some cases, it's NAN, not a number, et cetera, et cetera. Go through this so you guys figure out what it's all about. Next over here, it's important to keep case sensitivity in mind. So if you created a variable var, first of all, oh, the word itself, var, you can type var all in uppercase or sum in uppercase, sum in lowercase. The exact language word that you need to write is var in lowercase. Then the variable name itself, if you called it var x, and then later you try to talk about x in uppercase, 
you're going to get a programming error saying, hey, I never heard what this X is. Well, what do you mean you never heard what X is? I created a variable var X right here. Yeah, but since uh, case sensitivity is, is a thing, uh, uppercase and lowercase matters. If you wrote it in lowercase, then that's the one that I recognize. You can make a totally separate second variable called uh, var X in uppercase. And that's a completely different box in the storage room. Imagine going to the storage room and saying, yeah, please pull up a box uh, labeled X. And then you come in another day and you say, please bring me box labeled X. And you're actually talking about two different ones. And the guy has to ask you, please specify X in uppercase or X in lowercase. Because in programming languages such as JavaScript, that matters. So case sensitivity is a thing. Next, adding two numbers with JavaScript. We learned about doing those mathematical calculations. Subtraction, multiplication with the star symbol, the asterisk, division using the forward slash symbol. That's what does uh, dividing in JavaScript. And again, I'm running through this very quickly, but I would very highly recommend you go through this one by one because actually doing it, actually typing in and going through the tests, here, let me show the next example. Increment a number with JavaScript, okay? So now he's teaching us how, one way, how to change the, the, how to add one to the number that's inside of your variable box is by saying equals, put into this box that I already have, put in whatever is already inside of it, plus one. That's one way how you can add one, you know, plus one uh, to a number that you have in your program's storage room. But another way how to do that is to use the plus plus operator, which basically is the same idea as adding one. So what is the exercise over here? Let's just read through this quickly. You can easily increment or add one to a variable with the plus plus operator, such as i plus plus. If we have a, a variable called i, just a single lowercase letter i, then in this case, this would increment it, this would add one to it. And this is the equivalent of typing i equals i plus one, because it adds one to whatever number was there before. If before it was a zero, it's gonna end up being one. If before it was a hundred, it's gonna end up being 101. Note the entire line becomes i plus plus semicolon, eliminating the need for the equal sign. So it's a nice little shorthand to use. So now the exercise is what? Change the code to use the plus plus operator on my var. Hint, learn more about arithmetic, ar uh, arithmetic operators, increment plus plus. I'm going to right click this in another tab because it is good to look into and learn the details. And what do you know? They like my uh, favorite website as well. They link you to MDN, Mozilla uh, Developer Network. And over here, they teach you about JavaScript and they teach you about using these mathematical operators in JavaScript, plus, minus, times, dividing, et cetera, et cetera. So it's always good to read up on documentation and stuff. And now let's actually run this exercise. So instead of saying my var equals my var plus one, let's see some responses in the chat. What should I write there to solve this particular exercise? What do you guys think? Go ahead, guys. Okay, very good. And see the rest of your name here, Greenspan. My var plus plus, and that's what I'll do. And let's see if he likes it. And I'm going to click run the tests. That means to say, uh, go ahead and check my code and see if the result is correct. Clicking, and he says, check, it's good, we did it. And now you can click to go, go to the next challenge. Uh, you guys can sign in with an account, with an email, so they save your progress, they remember where you're holding. Highly recommend it, go for it, do the whole thing, you will, definitely benefit from it. And just like we have plus plus, we also have minus minus, uh, same idea. Uh, I do apologize, please forgive me if I do skip these a little bit, but go ahead and do them please. Next, decimal numbers with JavaScript. So it's slightly different than having just a regular number. You'll get more used to this idea as you do more programming, but there is a bit of a difference kind of between if you have just a simple number, that's an integer, that's just, you know, a number between zero, one, two, three, four, a hundred, a thousand, a million, several million, uh, and that's it, versus having a number that has fractional parts, that has some number dot some fractional part to it. Um, so here we're learning a little bit about having decimals. 
and that is expressed by putting a dot. What's the exercise over here? Create a variable my decimal and give it a decimal value with a fractional part. Example, 5.7. Um, oh, because this is called R decimal. So you should basically create var my decimal and also assign to it 5.7. Run the tests. Yeah, that's basically easy. Very simple, very, very easy exercises here. But now that you did it, it's in your system. You remembered it. And you're going to know next time you want to make a number that's a fraction, that has a fractional part, you're already going to have it in your system. You'll remember how to do it. Or at least you'll remember where to look it up and where you learned about it. Okay. Multiply two decimals with JavaScript. Uh, there is some differences to be aware about when you're dealing with numbers that are whole numbers and numbers that are with decimal parts. Sometimes things can get a little strange. Um, numbers that have a decimal part is, for the most part, most of the time will be reliable, but sometimes they might give you some strange results. Like instead of saying 2.0, it might tell you 1.9999999999999999. And because in the programming language of how it works, sometimes 1.9999999999999 is close enough or equivalent enough to 2.0. Uh, this is not usually the case, but it's important to be aware of that because mistakes like that sometimes do happen, and sometimes you wonder how come the math is wrong or something's incorrect. Sometimes when you do math on these decimal numbers, it's important to be aware that these issues could sometimes happen, and they'll probably mention about this at some point over here. Dividing decimal numbers. Okay, good exercise to do. Now here's a good uh, additional operator to learn about, and that's the modulus, modulo operator, operator. I'm not sure exactly how, oh, here we go, modulus, something like that. The idea is after you divide a number, what's the remainder, right? So if I say, here, let's open up over here a uh, console. Actually, last time we did a console, let's practice a little bit how this works in an actual page, page in the browser. I'm gonna open up my, Code developer over here. I'm going to open a folder. Where is my um, here we go? Projects. This was all the projects. Let's do an example of how this actually works. And by the way, we're still continuing to try to build our a number guessing game program. This is what we're aiming to go towards. And as soon as we learn enough of the fundamentals to do that, we're going to immediately implement that exercise. So um, here, let's say you have a web page, you have your HTML, you have your CSS and stuff going on. Uh, over here, this is a bad example actually, because I, I there's a bunch of CSS right in the HTML file, and best would be to have it separate in the CSS file. But notwithstanding that, let's demonstrate how does it work to have JavaScript as a separate file properly separated away into its own JavaScript file. I'll work with this one. Okay, let's work with this one. So here you have a regular HTML file. I'm gonna go up into the head and I'm going to create a script tag. And Actually, interestingly enough, a script tag, if you want, you can put into the head of your document, or if you want, you can even put it anywhere inside the body of your document. And there are some reasons that have to do with performance and the order of how the page loads that it might sometimes be recommended as often as possible, unless it doesn't make sense for whatever reason, uh, to put it at the bottom of your body. So instead of putting it in the head, I'm going to be going all the way to the, down to the closing body uh, tag over here. Let's zoom in a little bit so everyone can hopefully see a bit more clearly. I'm going all the way to the bottom of my document where I have the closing body tag. And right before that, I'm going to make, you know, right amongst all the other content that's in my page, right after all that, before the body tag closes, I'm putting a script tag. And one way how to do JavaScript programming is inside the script tag, you can start writing JavaScript code, like my var x, var x equals five or stuff like that. And you can do stuff like alert and it's going to work. The web page, as soon as you load it up, 
is going to execute that code. But the best way how to do things similar to CSS is to link in a file from a separate uh, place in your, you know, a separate JavaScript file. So we're going to say script source attribute equals, um, let's call it something like main.js. And now let's go ahead and create a file, new file, call it main.js. And now when I load up my page, it's going to load up this JavaScript file into my page and start executing whatever goes on inside there. So let's test if this actually works. I'm going to alert, is this working, question mark? And this I saved into a you know, main JS file that's not the HTML file, it's a separate file, but I linked it in with the script tag. And now let's open this up in our browser. If I can find where this needs to go. Um, let's see right over here. Source is in here. Here we go. OK. And right as soon as we load up the page, if you guys remember from when I was trying to catch up on the deals website, we have a pop-up that says, is this working? And I find that pretty cool because if I look into the source of the HTML that we typed over here, nowhere does it have that code. It must have been linked in from that JavaScript file that we pulled in. And if we open up that file, we see it has an alert. Is this working? And indeed, apparently, it is working. If I go back to the page, I refresh, I hit F5 or Control R, it executes the code in the JavaScript. So from now on, let's try to exercise when we're playing around with JavaScript. We're going to take off some of the training wheels and no longer do it just in the, uh, in the browser console. We're still going to do that sometimes as needed, when needed for little testing things. But let's try to get comfortable with coding JavaScript in the, browse, in the, in the web page of, of what you're developing, the HTML with the CSS. So what were we talking about over here that we were going to try and test? Let's go back over here to see. By the way, I uh, probably should have mentioned this earlier, but uh, I'm going to be jumping out by 9 o'clock, 9 o'clock Eastern time. So, um, and I'll be back uh, shortly after that. So Label will probably jump in, do some Q&A for a bit, as usual, uh, at 9 o'clock this time. Okay, so, oh, I was talking about finding a remainder with the modulo uh, operator. So uh, what this basically means is if I create variable x and I give it the value of, let's say, 24. And then let's say I want to, I could alert if I take x divided by 3. And then I'm going to do another thing, right? You guys can probably figure out what this is going to do. This is going to show us what happens if you divide x, whatever x happens to be, by 3. So in this case, 24 divided by 3 isn't really going to uh, divide very well. It's going to be seven, something like eight with a fraction or something like that, right? But now we're going to learn a new operator that we have. Alert x modulus modulo three. So uh, what this does is it gives you the result of dividing x by three. And what this does is it gives you the remainder after dividing x by three. Because sometimes in some situations, um, Anyone who wants to ask me in the chat, I'll explain to you an interesting scenario where this actually became very useful. Sometimes you want to know what is the remainder that's left over after dividing a certain number by, by another number if you only go by full numbers, whole numbers. We don't want to divide them into decimals. We don't want to have just fractions. If you divide 24 by 3, that means you want to have the result of 7 because 24 divided by 3, you can for sure have 7 divide, you know, for each of the 3. And then the remainder is, after taking 7 3 times is 21, the remainder of that is 3. After dividing 24 by 3, you have a remainder of 3. So this is what the modulo operator does. It tells you if you do, I'm going to do this as a little comment over here because we're explaining this to ourselves. If you do x divided by 3, then usually you might have something like 8 point, some sort of fraction. I'm not sure exactly what it is. But if you do only whole numbers, 
then x divided by 3 is 7 and 7 and 7. But that only leaves us with 21. And the remainder of 24, after giving 7 to each one 21, the remainder is a remainder of 3. And that's what the modular operator does. After dividing a certain number by another number, what is the remainder if we don't want to split numbers? You know, if you're dividing a pi into equal parts, you don't want to have half slices or quarter slices. You just want to give everyone entire slices and tell me what the remainder of the pi is. So let's see what this actually does. Um, let's make it slightly more interesting. If we divide 24 by 5, what does it divide into? And if what is the remainder if we divide uh, 24 by 5? Let's go back to the page, refresh. And at first, if we divide 24 by 5, it tells us 4.8. If you do 4.8 five times, you reach to 20, uh, 24. That's if you want to have fractions. You see, it didn't give us whole numbers. It gave us 4.8. Uh, but now it's going to run the next line of code, which is what is the remainder if we keep whole numbers? I'm clicking OK over here, and the result is 4. If we divide 20 into 5, then everyone is going to get a slice of only 20, and there's still going to be a remainder 4 of the 20, and that's the remainder that it gives us. So that's a little bit of an overview of what it's talking about here with the modulus operator. He might even be explaining it better over here, so as you go through this, feel free to catch up on that. Um, oh, here he explains a very interesting usage. The modulus operator helps you tell whether a number is odd or even. This happens a lot of times in programming. You want to know whether a certain number is odd or even for some reason or other. And when you take the remainder of division, then you can tell whether something is um, odd or even. That's one very important usage of the modulus operator. Go through that and play around with it yourself. You'll see uh, what it's all about, and, and you'll remember what, why, why it's important. Compound assignment with augmented addition. Let's see what he's talking about over here. Oh, he's telling us some of the other uh, cute shorthand operators that you can use. Instead of saying something equals something plus something, you can shorten that and just say something plus equals something. So um, basically instead of, uh, earlier we learned about adding one to a box, which basically means take whatever is already inside the box and add the mathematical plus one to it, and that should give us the result we want. And we shorten that to just typing plus plus, which just adds one to whatever is already there. Uh, but here, what if you don't just want to add one to a number? What if you want to add a hundred to a number, right? Whatever is inside the box, add a hundred to it. So usually we would have to say, okay, so then B, uh, you know, A equals A plus 12, you know, A equals A plus 100. But there's an, a cute little operator to do that in the more shorthand, which is plus equals. Take whatever is already inside this variable and add this value to it, and then put that in, back into the box. So whatever was here before is going to get changed. It's going to be, get replaced with what we put inside of it. And this could be a number, or this could be another variable, or this could be another variable with a bunch of calculations to it. You know, you can do whatever you want. All of these things over here is called um, expressions. What does an expression mean? Anything that you type that yields a value. Over here, what I'm highlighting over here with my mouse, when you type the number three, the number three is a very literal expression. Exactly what you see is exactly the value that it gives. The number three gives the value three. The number 17 gives the value 17. The number 12 gives the, gives the value 12. But what's interesting now is that these variables are also expressions. They also yield a certain value to them. Anytime in the future now that you say the variable a, like you say a plus 12 or 9 plus b, so a actually yields a value. a is going to give us the value of 3, right? When we type 3, evidently that's going to give us the expression, the value of 3. But the interesting part is that when you type A, when you type a variable, that also yields to you an expression. And you can take an expression, you can take a value that comes out of something and do anything you want with it. You can put that in a variable, you can do math on it, you can do a lot of different things to it, you can combine it with other variables, with other numbers, things that are literal expressions, like a number 12, a number 9, a number 7. 
and things that are uh, variables, which could be any number, but it also yields a value. Anything that gives out a value that's called an expression, it yields a result. You can use that to put stuff into a variable, to change what's in a variable, to combine it with mathematical operators, etc. So now I'm taking this expression, which means basically take whatever is inside box X and give me that value. So that expression gets assigned into whatever is in the box of B already. And we can make this expression more complicated. We can say X plus, uh, you know, six plus 4.5, et cetera, et cetera. And all of these are little expressions in their own right. You know, this is an expression that yields the value of 4.5. This yields six. This yields whatever might be in, in the variable X, which by the way is telling me an error over here because we never created a variable called X. Um, and then all of this together is its own expression. In fact, this over here is its own mathematical calculation that gives an expression. And then this over here is its own mathematical calculation that gives an expression and everything together. So all of these, when you combine them, give a result, they give a value. And that value, you can do other programming things with it, combine it with other things, put it in variables, et cetera, et cetera. Now, someone asked an interesting question about this. Let's say if I do something plus something minus something else, uh, times something else, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have a bunch of different variables, a bunch of different numbers. Um, how can we know for sure what is the order of operations? This is something known in, in, in math and al algebra, order of operations, O, O, O. If first we subtract 4.5 from six, and then we multiply it by ABC, that might give us one number. But if first we add X to, X to six, and then we subtract 4.5 from that, and then we multiply it by ABC, that'll give us another number. You can try it yourself. You can try adding 10 to 20 and then subtracting some number from it. Or if you try uh, first multiplying what you subtract from 100 and then adding 10 and 20 to it, you're gonna get different numbers, different results, depending on what you do first and what you do next. So how do we know for sure, if I type a whole bunch of things over here, one after the other in succession, which order things are going to be executed in? And the answer is there is a certain order to this. Um, I think in algebra, there's a, I forgot what the uh, abbreviation is, is but, but there's some sort of a description of what the order, yeah, PEM, PEMDAS, exactly. Um, however you pronounce that. I never actually learned that in, uh, in any sort of math class or anything. But um, there is a certain order how things are supposed to work. Uh, but I myself, you know, again, being a programmer, you often want to take the most convenient way out. I don't even know if PEMDAS is the correct order of operations, how they do it in programming. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I can look up MDN and see MDN order of operations and find out all the details. But to be fair, I don't even want to do that necessarily because there's a simpler solution that I've been doing all this time which makes things a lot clearer to begin with, actually, for yourself and for other programmers. So I might even recommend, don't even bother figuring out which one comes first and which one comes next. Why don't you just do, um, I think, what the P in PEMDAS is, which is parentheses. Anytime you use parentheses, the innermost parentheses, I think, has the highest precedence. And then we go on to the outermost parentheses and just parentheses, parentheses, parentheses will make things very, very clear. So even if usually, uh, this multiplication would happen first, or this uh, addition would happen first. You can totally change that order around if that's what you wanted to do by wrapping this stuff in parentheses first. Parentheses are a perfectly valid piece of programming code that you can put in anywhere you want in these kinds of expressions, in these kinds of uh, mathematical pieces of code that you're writing. If you put them in the right spot, right, it doesn't make sense to open the parentheses here, for example, and finish it uh, right after the math operator, right? Six minus 4.5. Hey, why are you putting a parentheses interrupting me in the middle over there? That's not the right spot to put it. If you put it in the right spot, you can wrap things inside of parentheses. And now this stuff inside of the parentheses is going to happen before uh, all the rest of the expression that's happening around it. And you can get even more detailed about this. I want first that he should multiply this by ABC. And then he should get that result and subtract that from six, and then take all of that result and add that to X. Then this is how you would do it with programming, just wrap it in parentheses, and it makes things very clear for yourself. You didn't even have to memorize, does addition happen first? Does, does subtraction happen first? 
You just wrap things in parentheses the way you want it, the way you understand how you want the code should operate, and then it makes things very, very clear. People looking at this code will never confuse and say, hmm, uh, it looks like first we're adding six to X, right? Because look, X plus six, right? And then we're subtracting, you know, the rest of the stuff. Evidently, that's not the case. The parentheses makes it very, very clear that no, 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 no. This happens first. First, this stuff in this parentheses over here, that's what is, you know, that belongs to its own section, to its own compartment. You know, that happens on its own. And then the result of that is what's tacked down to the addition with the X. I'm pretty sure actually this will probably be brought up in the pre-code camp at some point. We'll probably come across it soon enough. But it's important to know order of operations, precedence, and how you can make things to your advantage the way you see it, the way you understand it, by wrapping it with as many parentheses as you need, which is good for yourself and it's good for other people looking at your code. It'll be very clear for everyone what exactly you're trying to do. Sometimes this is exactly where problems happen and where errors happen and where you can debug your code and find the error and fix the problem by saying, hey, it seems very clearly that first he wanted to multiply a number and then he wanted to sub subtract a number. That's what evidently, clearly, it looks like he was trying to do. And that's clearly incorrect. It seems very clearly from what we're supposed to be doing here that first we need to be adding the number and then we should be doing the, the parentheses. So you'll see right away. Sorry, I, I'm not sure what shortcut I did over there that zoomed everything out. So you can see right away, okay, this was a bug the way it used to be before. I'm going to change where the parentheses are at. I'm going to take out this one and that one. And I'm going to make sure this happens first and take out this one. Oh, this is the correct way. Why was it so simple and easy to find? Because things were wrapped in parentheses to begin with. You found where those parentheses were wrong and you fixed them to do what you really intended, what it should have been doing all along, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a little bit about mathematical stuff in, um, in JavaScript. Uh, so we learned about the plus equals. We learned that uh, you can just as much do minus equals. It does the same thing. Um, you can do times equals. And you can do divided by equals. Okay, which basically takes whatever is inside of the variable. It divides it by the number that you give it. And it, so it assigns that result back into the variable. Next. Now we learned a bunch about JavaScript number variables. Now we're going to get into strings. Strings are basically, like we said, text that you wrap in between quotes. And it's very different than numbers. You know, numbers you do math with, you do calculations with. Strings is just, here is just some plain text. It's a little bit like the comments we were talking about, right? In comments, you're basically just writing some notes to yourself in your code. And the computer says like, oh yeah, I just have to ignore all that. I don't even have to pay attention if it's trying to tell me a command or something I need to do. This is just text. And the same thing when you're creating a variable for you know, some sort of uh, message or text or someone's name or last name or whatever. When you wrap it up in between quotes, whatever goes inside there, the computer just said, oh yeah, just that bunch of text as it is. That's just a bunch of text. Um, so this is how you create a variable for text. This is how, oh, this is an interesting thing, how to escape certain important uh, pieces of a string. How are you going to show someone a message that are supposed to have quotes inside of them? That gets tricky, doesn't it? Because if you're supposed to denote where does my message start with quotes, and you're supposed to denote where does my message end with quotes, but what if inside of your message you also want to say something with quotes? How are you supposed to do that? Can you just put a quote inside of your string? As you can see over here, we have a syntax error. We have the red error line over here telling us, uh, uh, uh. you start with a quote, you end with a quote, and any additional quotes around that is not understood. I don't understand what you're saying here. This is an error. So there's a trick how you do that is you use a backslash. By using a backslash right before any character that is supposed to have special meaning, that is supposed to be important, like in here, the quotes are important. They're supposed to denote where your string starts and where it ends. You can't just say, you know, double quotes at any point in the middle. That's going to confuse the computer. He's not going to know, does it start here? Does it end here? So in order to do that, you escape it with the escape character, the backslash, and you can exercise some more about that when you get to this lesson. Very important stuff. Okay, I'm going to be hopping out for just a few moments, and uh, we're going to do a bit more uh, delving into this um, 
how to get to our number guessing game as soon as I'm back momentarily. Uh, thanks to Blabel, I see you there. Let me uh, give you uh, the mic for a few minutes and I'll be back shortly. All right. Um, okay, so if you have any specific questions, please put it in the chat. Um, I see somebody put something in Q&A. Uh, I don't think we hear you yet. Oops. Does anyone hear? Um, hello, hello. Um, yes, they say they're here. Perfect. Um, Could be it's right. just me, uh, but if everyone else is hearing, that's fine. Okay. Um, before I get to specific questions, I just wanted to, there, there, there have been some questions that have come up in the Slack group. Um, a lot of different, you know, very specific HTML type questions. Here's my personal suggestion. Yisrael might disagree a little bit. I wouldn't get too caught up with specific tags and whether or not you should use div um, a lot or a little. I think you'll get a lot better at that as time goes on. You'll learn the rules better. You'll figure out best practice better. I think because we have such a short amount of time to learn as much as possible, um, meaning we're trying to cram an entire web application into, you know, just eight weeks um, and just a couple times a week. So my personal suggestion would be don't get too stuck on HTML tags and even the exact way to write the CSS. If you, you know, if you have extra time, I would suggest jumping into more JavaScript stuff, practicing more JavaScript stuff. Um, that's going to be more important. As long as you can get, you know, you can get it working on the front end in the HTML and CSS so that it looks decent, so that it um, has, you know, it looks the way you want it to look, it has the data you want it to have, etc. I really wouldn't get too caught up in that. Um, that's just stuff that you'll learn with time. You'll learn exactly the best practices. You can look it up, but I really would not get stuck on that now. I would try and spend more time on the actual code on the JavaScript um, and you know try not to fall behind on that part. Again, that's just my personal suggestion. Um, you can ask Yisrael for his opinion, but I think he would be more or less on the same page. Um, all right. Is variable only in order of sequence or does it change the whole file? Uh, see if you can add a little bit more context to that question. Um, somebody asked, why do we even need to know if a number is odd or even? It's just, so you'll find a lot of kind of silly exercises <clears throat> when it comes to these various coding problems. For example, one of these uh, will be like reverse a string, right? So you're never gonna need to reverse a string. You're never gonna have to take the, screen, the, the string recording and turn it into Gnid, Rick, whatever, you know? Um, but the idea is there, these are just different challenges to teach you the code, to teach you JavaScript, to, think, to teach you how to think in code, how to think, <clears throat> how to think algorithmically. Um, so these are exercises and, you know, you never know. Actually, I, they're, they're, Actually, in my in my job, I use this very often. I'll explain to you how. Um, this is the number odd or even. This gets a little bit into some deeper concepts, but very often if you're writing something to the database, um, let's say you just got a file with a million members and you need to write it to your database. Let's say you, um, let's say you're a banking type of application. Let's say you're like a uh, personal finance app. Maybe you know of like mint.com or um, so you need a budget, some of these different budgeting apps. So let's say once a day you go to Chase Bank and all the banks and you pull in a file of everyone's transactions. It doesn't actually work this way, but let's say that's how it worked. So all of a sudden, boom, you get all the data and then you write it all to the database. Now, the problem is what happens? You write a million records to the database all at once um, it will crash. So what do you do? You do some kind of batching. You say, hey, every thousand records break. Um, and what, is, what does break mean? Just like batch it, uh, stop for five seconds, whatever, for one second, for five milliseconds, whatever it is, just to give the database time to catch up. 
So how would you do that? You would say, you would keep a count of where you're holding. Oh, I'm at record number one. I'm at record number two. I'm at record number a thousand. Oh, you're at record number a thousand. What's the easy way to check that? You use the modulus operator and you check if 1000 mod, whatever the batch size is. So you keep a batch size and then you can change that batch size whenever you want. So let's say every 500 records you want to break. So you would say if my number, my current count mod or modulus, my batch size, let's say it's 500, if it equals zero, meaning it's now an even number, um, then break. Anyway, I'm not going to get into that too much, but my point is sometimes you do find use, uses for these, type of, these types of algorithmic challenges. Next, um, what are the purpose of tests like var a equals two for JavaScript? They don't appear to have anything to do with functions of a web page. Um, good, another similar question. So part of it just has to do with learning how to write code. Um, right now you're learning how to code. You're learning what is a programming language. How do you write, how do you store variables? How do you manipulate variables? How do you um, change the value of them? How do you loop? You're, you're learning all these things. Um, very soon you'll learn how to then use that to manipulate data on the web page, to send a request. Maybe every 30 seconds, you want to send a request to your server to say, by the way, the member's still on the page. By the way, the member's still on the page. Just ping the server. Um, that you all you do all that through JavaScript. Maybe you keep a variable that's, you know, how many times you've already pinged the server, and maybe you only want to do it 10 times. So you keep a variable and you increment the variable and you increment it up till 10, oh, and then you stop. I'm not going to ping my server anymore. So there's a ton, a ton of different um, use cases for this. And basically any web page that you go to will be using a lot of JavaScript in the background. Um, there'll be a lot of interesting dynamic stuff happening, but obviously we will get to that soon. Back to Shalom's question. Um, if you change the value variable in the middle of a file, does it change the definition of the variable throughout the file? So this gets into a question of scope. So uh, we talked about it a little bit last time where there's more general scope and then you get more and more narrow. Um, so there's like hard disk space and then there's RAM. Um, and then there's, when you get to like the browser, you have global scope, which means if you assign a variable var a equals one and you don't put it into a specific scope, again, we're gonna learn about this a little bit later, um, then it will work for the whole web page or the whole file as you're saying it. Um, and if you change it, we'll change that for everything. But then there's also like, what if I'm in a function? I don't know if you guys learned about functions yet. What if I'm in a function and I declare variable A inside of a function? So that will only be um, assigned inside of that function. And as soon as you're out of the function, it stops. So I don't know if you learned about this stuff yet, but basically in short, the answer to your question is it all depends on the scope of where the variable was assigned and where it gets reassigned, et cetera. So you can look up JavaScript intro to JavaScript scope or to programming scope, probably JavaScript scope. You can look that up and you'll get some more info there. Um, you feel like we're doing a lot of practice in free code camp and learn a lot, but it's not coming down to a real writing code. What do you suggest to do? There's some project that we need to write. Good question. Um, the answer is more or less that you really, you have to learn the very basics first. Um, and with free code camp, for example, if you want to try and jump ahead, you could. Um, it gets into projects. There actually happens to be free code camp is working on a new curriculum that's more project based. The beginning of free code camp is much more like these little assignments and then it jumps into bigger projects. So if you do five or 10, let's say you do 30, 40% of each section. Um, and then you want to jump into one of the projects like building, I think they have like a bingo game or a calculator or different projects then you can definitely do that. You can learn the very basics and then jump into um, a project. But yeah, you definitely, you're going to first have to learn the very basics and then you'll be able to jump into projects. But the idea is to be able to get to a more project-based type of learning. Um, I think I covered everything in the Q&A section. Let me look at the chat. I here. Um, is it fine that we're going through free really fast? Um, yes. Is it fine that you're going through free code camp really fast? That's, that's great. Um, 
feel free to go at your own pace. Um, the class is Yisrael is trying to find a balance between going a little bit faster and a little bit slower um, to make sure, you know, we don't leave people behind, but also that the people who are going a little bit ahead don't get bored. Um, but definitely, you know, this is only two hours a week or whatever it is, four hours a week. Um, you're not going to get everything from just this in eight weeks. So definitely continue learning on your own. Go through Free Code Camp. It's a phenomenal resource. They also have a great community. If you want to ask questions, I think they have slash forum. You can ask questions there. It really is a very, very good community. Um, so yes, feel free to, if you're going fast, you know, that's great. Try and create, you know, try and create a little small project. Um, maybe start peeking at some of the code on the front end, the JavaScript front end of top baby deal. There isn't much there, but there's just some small stuff. Um, so definitely you can go ahead. Nothing wrong with that. Um, so going forward after this course, again, we have still quite a few weeks this course. Personally, I really recommend trying to stick to one thing. Free Code Camp has a lot, has almost everything you need in terms of a beginner getting into code. Um, you'll have projects. Yes, the beginning will be a little difficult. By the way, some of the JavaScript algorithm challenges will get kind of difficult and you'll be banging your head against the wall. Um, try your best not, <clears throat> not to like watch the videos that just walk you right through it. Really try and uh, come up with it yourself. If you are having trouble with some of these assignments, <clears throat> this would be my suggestion. Don't go just watch, um, there's like a ton of YouTube channels that will just tell you the answers to all these. Try not to do that. If you do want another resource that will help you practice some of your JavaScript, you can go, this is something I used, you can go to a website called codewars.com, I think, just Google Code Wars, and start from the very easiest level and pick the language JavaScript, and they'll give you some very, um, they'll give you some very basic um, algorithm challenges and things that will help you learn JavaScript. So again, try to stay away from watching, you know, so-called cheat videos as much as possible. Um, so if you do want something else to practice JavaScript, Code Wars is not a bad one. Uh, but try and stay, try to stay on Free Code Camp as much as possible. Ask on the forums if you need help. Um, can you inspect the website? Can you see the JS? Generally, yes. Um, you can also go to so the Sources tab, um, but we'll get to that later. Uh, we'll post the website. I believe it's called CodeWars.com. But again. Try to stay on free code camp as much as possible. The worst thing you can run into is the scatter brain where you're trying a bunch of different tutorials. This is just if you're having, if you're really knocking your head against the wall on some of these algorithm challenges and you want something slightly easier to just practice a little bit more, you can go to codewars.com and try a little bit. Um, what's the final goal of this course from the teacher's perspective? I believe it is that you should be able to build a small web, web application on your own um, you should be able to come out of this course with something like a top baby deal in your own version that, um, you know, you customize to your own needs. Maybe you use the scraping concept for something else for a personal tool. Maybe you have it go through all your Facebook posts and find everything interesting. Um, well, the idea is to give you the tools that you should be able to build basic web applications on your own. Will you be able to build complex stuff? Will you be able to build Facebook after this? No. Um, if you learn a lot on your own and you do a lot of free code camp on your own, yes, you'll be much further ahead. And by the end of this, let me backtrack one, one second here. What's the goal of this? The goal is that you should know basic HTML, CSS, JavaScript. You should also know about servers. You should also know about databases, very basic stuff, um, you know, ba a basic version of that so that you should be able to create this full web application. So again, how complex is the web application that you'll be able to build at the end of this? It depends how much time you put in on your own. Some people will be faster, some people, people will be slower, but you should have the fundamentals and really understand the process of building web applications. Maybe your goal at the end of this is to go to a boot camp, and here you're getting your, you know, the, the introductory stuff so that you'll, you know, you have a leg up, which is not a bad idea. Maybe you're, you have a full-time job, but you're doing this, um, you know, a couple hours a night. And the idea is eventually to maybe learn over six, 
eight months um, or something like that instead of you know a more compressed three or four months. But either way, at the end of this, you should have the basics, the fundamentals. You should really know um, how to create something very basic. And it's really the, from my perspective, it's more about um, really throwing yourself into the world of development, right? Once you're in it, after these eight weeks, you'll really have a good idea of what it means to work as a developer, what, is it, what it means to build applications. Um, you'll have a better idea of if you want to pursue this full time, uh, what the next steps are. It's really a springboard. This course is a springboard. It's not going to get you a job, but it's a springboard and it will clear a lot of things up for you. It will help you, um, you know, basically find your next steps. Yeah, the rest I will try and, you know, feel free to ask them in one of like the random channels or something in the Slack group and I will do my best to answer. Um, yeah, with that, I'll give it back to you, Sorrel. We mostly went through just general stuff. I gave one suggestion that you may or may not agree with, and that is to not get too stuck. I saw some people asking questions about like very specific HTML tags and whatever. I suggested not getting too stuck on that stuff now and trying to spend more time on the actual code on the JavaScript. You'll learn that stuff as you go. If you don't know about an address tag, that's fine. You'll figure it out when you need to know about it. Um, yeah, yeah I, I, I agree with that. It's, it's, uh, I, I would maybe so suggest a lot more to look on other sites, see how they do different things. And you might find very often they don't exactly use the address tag and they don't, they're not very specific about certain tags. I guess it's some sort of balance. It's good to be inclined to use certain HTML tags, semantically correct ones for the correct purposes. So I tried drilling that in a lot to begin with. Ultimately, though, in real life, a lot of things happen in programming and people div all over the place and use generic tags all over the place and it, it happens. So, yeah, I, I agree. If, if it comes in the way between you and, try, and actually trying to learn things and go ahead and practice the next thing and put something together because you're getting too stuck on am I being Mahader and using the right one here and right one there, then, yeah, be a little bit lenient about that sometimes. Yeah. All right. Okay, cool. Shkoyach Label, appreciate you jumping in over here. Um, and I think uh, uh, as a little continuation, I think, so I think what I overheard you saying just before about, you know, coming out of this uh, course, these classes with a good, uh, at least a, a feel, a good understanding of groundwork of what it's all about and what it entails. Uh, just wanted to mention a quick little interesting story I remember from Smicha, which is the rabbinical certi certification that we get after going through yeshiva. And uh, there is notoriously a famous uh, rabbi that ordains people with smicha, known as Rabbi Yaroslavsky. Uh, apparently he has, some people say he has specific uh, instructions from the higher ups, from the Rebbe himself, to uh, be kind of lenient when he uh, uh, tests some of the students, because as long as they know their stuff good enough, doesn't have to be perfect, but he could already kind of consider them, okay, you, I see you know what you're talking about, it might be good enough. Uh, when he tests them and he ordains them uh, with rabbinical uh, certification. So an interesting story that happened once is that he was, uh, he was testing a bunch of students to see if they know this stuff. And he poses a question, he asked a question to the students. And uh, one of the students uh, was selected to try and answer the question. And he opens up the subject material book because in this test, you're, it's okay to kind of review and look through and, 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 and discuss the different, uh, you know, actual subject matter that we're talking about. So he opens up his book and he starts flipping to the page. And even just by flipping to the right page, Rabbi Yaroslavki says, do mish good, do mish good. I see you're flipping the pages right. Meaning I see you know where to look for the answer. And that to me gives me a feeling that you know what you're talking about, you know where to find the answer, and that's good. Uh, I'm not sure if he actually accepted that as a valid answer, but the idea was that he said, oh, I, I see you know how to Google it. I see you know where to find the answer. And I hope uh, more than anything in this course, in this, these classes, uh, in addition to actually getting some hands-on learning how HTML works, how CSS works, how JavaScript works, you actually know where to find answers. You know what the concepts are, you know what you're looking for, and you will probably most definitely, even after this very concentrated crash course, you will have enough knowledge, the basics enough of springboards enough under your belt that if you wanted to figure it out fully and go ahead with it fully, 
and really learn it and get started and practice and exercise and do some things, you know where to go after you're done with this course. You know what to look for, what it's about, and where you can find it. And with that itself, you're in a way, it's almost like, as it's called in Gomorrah, it's only mechus or maise. It's only missing that you could just got to go ahead and do it. But other than that, you know how to do it. And in this day and age, with all the information out there, it's as good as done. So yeah, that's, that's what we're trying to, yeah. Let me just, while, while we're on this topic anyway, I might as well just add. So sure. there's obviously a lot of people have different specific goals from this course, right? Some people maybe want to do everything they can to get out of this course and do everything they can do to get a job right away. Some people just want to learn, you know, about web development. Maybe they want to do a little bit of front end work. Maybe they have a business and they're trying to learn some basic stuff. So yes, your goals may be different and it's hard for us to cater to everyone's specific goals. Um, feel free to reach out to me personally, at least on Slack, or I can post my number. You can send me a voice note with your specific situation. And I'm happy to try and guide you a little bit, you know, for what you should focus on outside of these specific two hours. I'll give you an example. If somebody's goal is maybe to try and go to a boot camp right after this and then do three, four months and try to get a job right away, I would personally suggest that in the time outside of this, you practice some of the more algorithm type questions because um, that's the kind of stuff that the better boot camps will look for that you have a good understanding of like these types of uh, I'm not sure where you're holding so far um, but things like um, things like how can you reverse a string or thing, those types of challenge things and the things I told you that you can play around with on a site like Code Wars which again I said is just you know only if you really get stuck on some of this free code camp stuff you could you should play around there but again, it all depends on what your goals are. If again, if you're a designer and you're just trying to learn how to be better with the HTML and CSS part of it, maybe it's not as relevant to really dig so deep into the code aspect. So feel free to send me a voice note or something on Slack and I'll try and help guide you um, with what you should be focusing on a little bit more. Anyway. Excellent, yeah, very valid points. Straight after a bit of label. Okay, so let's jump right back into where we were here. Um, I'm going to be a little bit daring here and try to take a deep dive a little bit ahead. Again, I'm going to hope and expect of you guys uh, as part of homework to go through every single one of these steps. And each individual one is like so simple and so specific and so easy. It's one concept, a few phrases that explains it. You actually try it out, you test it, and it takes a minute, but then you realize, oh, I get it. This makes sense obviously if we're going to do programming stuff and you need to be able to tell the computer to do this kind of thing and that kind of thing evidently we have to have something like this and we have to have something like that so yeah so it's going to click it's going to make sense you go through these one by one and you figure things out i want to focus on some skills we're going to need specifically for the um game a uh, number guessing game which we need still a few more fundamentals to get that happening but let me show you for example first let me show you one example of like uh, oh yeah, that concept makes sense. We need to have that sort of thing in a programming language in order to, you know, get some work done, in order to be able to, to, to make sense of things and to work with things. So for example, uh, along the line over here, you're going to learn about something called arrays. What are arrays? Well, uh, let's say you're making a program that has to do with a lot of people's information. So it has a bunch of contacts and each one of these contacts has a first name, a last name, uh, an address, you know, the street uh, number and, 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 and the street name and number and city, state, zip, etc., etc. And you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these, you know, sets of per people's contact information. Maybe you even have thousands upon th thousands, tens of thousands of, of records, hundreds of thousands of records, right? And let's say someone needs to browse through that kind of information and look through them and see, you know, they're searching for a certain name or they're looking up uh, people with this last name or people who live in this area or something, right? So let's say you make a program, you make a web page where you have all this information available and the guy is able to browse around them and look through them and do whatever he wants to do, right? So let's just think, technically speaking here, how are you going to have, you know, 100,000 first names and last names and addresses and zip codes, right? They, they have to exist somewhere, right? In order for us to work with it, in order for us to show it to the user, in order for us to present it as an address, in order to try to print it, uh, whatever you want to do with it, you have to have it somewhere in your program. If it doesn't exist somewhere, then how are you going to work with it? 
So the way how you have stuff in a program is you need to store it in the program's storage room, right? The memory, the, the information, the data that you have in your program, which are stored in variables, apparently. So does that mean that we have to have 100,000 variables, something like this, var first name one equals John, okay? And that's from the first contact, okay? That's from the first guy. Uh, but then the next guy, first name number two is uh, whatever, Robert. And then first name number three, is whatever right and and um whatever and and okay and that's just the first name right okay so let's go back now we have to make his last name okay last name number one okay uh doe and then this guy last name number two okay etc etc you guys get this idea we're having uh, a bit of a technical limit over here which is that is this really how it works in programming you got to basically manually type up variable after variable after variable after variable in order so you can have, you know, in your program that you could have this first guy's first name and this, first, this guy's last name and then have something for his address and for his city and zip and phone, and, right? And that's just the first guy. And then you have to have that 100,000 times for all the people in the contacts list so that now you can make some more coding that the guy will have a, a cool little search box that he's going to type in a search for a name and you're going to go looking through all the names and the variables to find which is the ones that he wants to work with. Um, is it really like this? Like one by one by one by one, you have to make thousands upon thousands of these variables. How does, how does this actually work? Well, as it turns out, arrays actually help with this issue. Arrays are another kind of variable in a way. The idea of this variable is that it's a variable of variables. So if we're talking about boxes until now for a single individual box that you can put something inside of it, this would be like, I don't know what you want to call it, a conveyor belt or an entire storage section or a, uh, a truck maybe. Maybe arrays are like a truck where you could have in there a whole bunch of variables. So maybe you're going to do something like uh, first names. And you're going to do this new code that we're learning over here of how to make arrays, which is the opening and closing square brackets. And now inside of this uh, truck, you can load up a bunch of boxes, each one with the first name of that particular record. Uh, that might look something like this. Either you could say during while you're creating the variable, you can right away fill it up with a whole bunch of stuff inside of it. So I'm going to make one first name and I'm going to make another first name. And I'm going to make a third first name, etc., etc., etc. Okay, so it still seems like it has a lot of manual kind of work that you have to type one after another after another. And we'll get to that. that. That's another thing we're going to solve with databases and that's going to be a little bit further down the line. But at least one thing we solved for now is you don't have to create, you know, 500,000 individual variables, individual boxes, and you have to remember each one by name. What was the label of this box? And what was the label of that box? You can put all of your first names, for example, into one big truck. And this truck has in it a lot of variables. As you see over here, this is where the truck begins, so to speak, and this is where the truck ends. And inside of it, you have individual variables. This one right here, it starts with, you know, it's a string variable, basically, and it ends over here with a comma. This is as good as having made another separate variable over here, var x equals John. So instead of having a variable named x that has inside of it John, I created a truck, I created an, an array of variables, and the first one over here, its value sitting in its kind of uh, neat little, uh, in its row, you know, in the array of all the other variables that are inside of this truck, in its little cubicle, it has the value of John, and the next variable, next in line, has the value of Robert, and the next one has the value of blah, blah, blah. Um, now, how do you use this, right? When I create variable x equals John, then uh, the way how I use this, like if I want to alert John or whatever the name may be, whatever the name may be, then I just use the name of that variable, right? 
But in this case, all we have is one name, right? We have one name for the entire truck. So how are you going to work with individual cubicles, individual boxes inside of that truck? How does that work? When you have each box as its own individual label, that's one thing. But how does it work with arrays? In arrays, you use also the square bat brackets, and you type in a number of which one we want to work with. So over here, we're working with a truck called first names, and we do the opening and closing square brackets. And then we say, I want element number one, or element number two, or element number three. And that gives you the value of the one in that order of which one we're referring to, except, very importantly, that it is offset zero. And what that means is that the first number starts by zero. This is something to start getting used to in programming uh, because computers work with ones and zeros and, and the different ways of how integer numbers are calculated. As it turns out, number one, in a way, is actually number zero. And number two is actually number one. And number three is actually number two. Everything is shifted off by one and starts from number zero. So if you want to be talking about this guy over here, his index, his number in the row of all the other variables in this array is actually zero. If you want to talk about him, you got to say, give me first names number zero. Number zero, that makes no sense. You want nothing? No, I don't want nothing. I want the one that's number zero. The first one is actually number zero. We humans would call that number one, but the computer calls that number zero. And this guy over here, obviously, is number one, and we humans would call that, oh, that's the second one, right? So that's number two, et cetera, et cetera. In programming, when working with arrays, things start off by the number zero. It's called being offset zero or starting off by index zero. Um, and so you could alert this. This is how you work with a variable that is inside of an array. You say, give me uh, element number zero in this array called first names, right? Instead of having a straight up variable like X that you say, just give me X. Whatever is inside X, alert that. Now you're saying, give me the truck, give me the array uh, called first names and get the number zero inside of that one. And that's the one that I want to use here. And you can use these pretty much as with any other variable. If this was, for example, an, an array of numbers, let's play around with that for a little bit, uh, var nums equals an array. And I'm going to put in some random numbers over here, 10, 55, 102, whatever, right? So over here as well, I created a truck, I created an array, and inside of it, instead of, of creating tediously one by one by one variable after variable, the first one has 10, the second one has 55, the third one has 102. If they somehow belong together, if they have a connection between each other, if they're like a bunch of numbers that's in a sequence that makes sense to put them all in one big package and say, here, just store all of them in this thing together, right? Because some things doesn't make sense like that necessarily. Some things you should have like as a separate variable on its own. That's just that thing that belongs on its own. Like maybe the score, you know? You don't have a hundred different scores necessarily. You have your score. You have your age. Well, if you have, let's say like the amount of guesses or the number of guesses that you guessed in the game, right? First, I guess number five. Then I guess number seven. Then I guess number six then you might put that into an array, you're right? Because you, you can keep loading up on that truck. Uh, oh, here's another number that belongs to that group. They all kind of belong in a group. This is all the numbers that you guessed. So it doesn't make sense to have the first variable of the same thing, which I call this, and the second variable of the same thing, which I call something else, and the third variable that I call something else. And now I have to refer to each one with their own individual name. Oh, this box over here, that box over there, the other box. Just put them all in one big truck and say, this is a truck that holds all the numbers of the guesses that I did. So let's say those numbers belong together for some reason. You put, bunch them all together in an array, and I have an array with four elements. Element zero is 10, element one is 55, element two is 102, element three is blah, 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 whatever goes on over there. Then you can do the same kind of stuff we were doing until now with these variables. You could say something like uh, var test equals, nums zero plus three. So please, uh, someone tell me in the chat, if I called into this array of uh, nums and I said, among all the nums that are inside of this num, give me element number zero 
okay? That's the variable I want to work with and add three to it. What is the result that the variable test is going to be? Let me look at the chat over here. Uh, yep, you're right, number 13. Because you're taking that one variable out of the array and you're saying add three to it and, you know, just like any other variable. You can do 10 of these in a row. You can multiply, you can divide, you can subtract, all the usual things that we do with variables. You can do with these over here and you could, you know, have fun with that, do the same old things, alert them, math them, divide them, do the modulus operator. You can put in fractional numbers in there, et cetera, et cetera. This is just the way how arrays work. Arrays is convenient way how to have a whole sequence, a whole array of variables rather than making them tediously one by one by one. You can make a whole bunch of them and work with them in tandem in a sequence and with a lot of useful things that comes out of that. That's a useful feature to know that like when you go through it and you realize, yeah, this really solves a problem. You know, if you have tons of variables of the same kind of concept in your programming language, it's useful to have a way how to package them all together, work with them in huge amounts and, you know, operate on them as you need to do. Um, so that was a little bit of an overview about arrays. And now I wanted to go to something that heads us in more in the direction of completing our number guessing game. And that is using conditional logic with if statements. This is one of the big, very fun, very interesting um, building blocks of programming languages. Actually over here, you're already seeing something else called a function, but I'm not exactly ready to play around with functions yet. Uh, that's another very fundamental concept which either we'll learn directly or uh, I'm going to rely on you guys figuring it out from free code camp. But let's go quickly through um, if statements. If statements is a, is a fundamental concept in programming. You're going to use it all the time. It's basically this idea where unlike HTML, where you say like, just here is a bunch of elements, just make them into a document. Thank you. And CSS that says, just make this look like that and make that look like that. And, we, and that's it. A programming language like JavaScript, can come kind of and use logic and say, well, if something, then do this. If something else, then do that, right? Going back to the analogy of you're programming your computer, you have your little pet robot that you're programming to uh, sweep the whole floor like a Roomba, right? So then you program it. Let's say you, you, you set your little robot to go off into the living room and start sweeping everywhere. And it kind of got stuck by uh, bumping into a wall and it didn't know what to do at that point. And uh, it just stayed there, you know, it had like error. I don't know what to do now. So then you give it some logic. You say, okay, okay. Let's say you bumped into a wall. Uh, if you're able to turn into the other direction and continue, then proceed. If you're not able to, try to go right back in the direction where you came from and then turn to another direction. If you're able to turn to that other direction, then continue. If you're not able to, then make a beeping sound and uh, et cetera. You know, you could tell them all sorts of these logical branching off forking of information where in your program, it's not just one straight line of this happens. I command you to do this, to do that. And I command you to do the next thing. And that's it. That is one straight line of just do this, do this, do this. But rather there are branches in your code. Things can branch off depending on the situation. One day, the if situation might result in this direction. Another day, the if situation could result in the other one. And your program is ready to do both of them because you prepared it in advance to know if this happens, do this. And if something else happens, then do that. So let's see how that works a little bit. And also let's have a quick peek and how we have that kind of concept in our little number guessing game. Uh, we humans all the time in life, we have all sorts of if situations happening all the time, right? So when we're playing this number guessing game in step number four, if the guesser guesses the right number, then the round is one. And, and there's another like step over here, which I fixed in the, chat, in, the, in, the, in the chat group over there, but I'm gonna just add it in here real quickly. If not, then go back to step two, right? So how do you play this game? Uh, think of a number between one and 10. The guesser is going to ask the player a number. The player responds with hints higher or lower. If the guesser guesses the right number, then the round is one. If the guesser did not guess the right number, then go back and repeat step two. You should guess another number. And then the other guy is going to respond with another hint of higher or lower. If now things are done, if now he won, then good. If not, then go back and keep repeating it. And this concept of if 
is a very important part of programming which really turns things alive in your program. It's really where you put in the logic, you know, the chachma in your, in your code, which is like, it reacts to different situations in appropriate ways, depending on the situation. So, um, it looks something like this. You type in the word if, you have an opening and closing parentheses, and then you have an open and closing uh, squiggly brace, whatever you call it, braces. Um, and inside of the first set of uh, the parentheses over here, you put in some sort of condition. You have to put in some sort of expression that will answer whether something is true or whether something is not true. So for now, I'm just going to fill in over here with dot, 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 because this is another thing we're going to learn momentarily, which is what can you put inside over there? I'm just going to put in a number one so that it stops uh, bothering me with the error line over there. And basically, the program says, oh, here's an if statement. So we, we reached a fork in the road. If what's inside of this parentheses turns out to be true, then we're going to do whatever stuff happens inside of these braces. And inside of these braces, you can do anything and everything as per usual. You can create variables. You could create arrays. You can do math. You can alert. You can do all sorts of things, which will only happen if this thing is true. So that's so cool. You can create a whole bunch of code in your programming where some of them might happen sometimes and some of them might not happen and, and other things might happen instead other times. And you write anything you want inside of here. There's no limit. You know, inside of here, you can write up a whole bunch of code, do a whole bunch of things that only happens in this situation. Let's learn some more things about this. Right after the closing brace, you have an opportunity to give the programming, you know, to give JavaScript a else kind of situation, which basically means if the above is actually false. If this is true, then do whatever goes on inside of these braces. Else, meaning if whatever was inside of the parentheses is false, was not correct, then don't do anything that was in the first, print, the first set of braces. Skip all that. All that stuff is going to be skipped over like you never wrote it. And instead, do the stuff that inside of, that's inside of these braces. And over here, you can create a bunch of other variables and, and do a whole bunch of other uh, stuff and, and, and alerting and, and all sorts of different things that we're going to be doing with programming and creating variables and math and arrays and whatever else is going on. So this is a very simple idea. If something is true, then do this stuff. Else, which means otherwise, you can do this other stuff. There's a few more interesting things you're going to learn when you go through the free code camp over there about if statements. You can do else if, which means check this other thing over here. If this is true, then do this stuff. Otherwise, check another thing. If this is true, then do this stuff. And then at the very end, you can do one last else to wrap it all up and say, if none of the above were true, then just do this. This is optional, however. You can skip that. And then it's only going to do this if this is true. It's only going to do this if this is true. And that's it. It's not going to do anything else. Or if you want, it could do something else. Uh, that's up to you. You can create something that only has an if. And that's it. It's just going to do that thing if that thing is true and move on with life. It's going to continue doing whatever other code is after. And this is, all comes after whatever code was there before. As soon as it comes to this if statement, it comes to this fork in the road. Do I need to do this stuff inside of the braces or not? Evaluating the stuff that's inside of the parentheses. So what are you going to put inside of the parentheses? What does it mean if something is true or if something isn't true? So for that, we need to learn about a new kind of variable. We learned about a variable that takes numbers. We learned about putting fractional numbers inside of a variable. We learned about putting strings of text inside of a variable, and now we're going to learn about Boolean values, uh, named after uh, the big uh, sci uh, computer scientist, I forgot what his name, Bool something or other, B-O-O-L-E or something. Or was he maybe a, uh, uh, could be he was a, a, ph a philosopher or something, uh, so things to do with truths in life and, and things like that. Boolean logic, if things are true or if things are false. Um, this has, Unlike a number or a value that's a piece of text, this variable can hold something like true, and it can hold something like false. Okay, so it's the same kind of idea. You're creating a box inside of the storage room of your programming language, and you're saying put inside of this box logical truth, or put inside of it logical falsehood. 
what is what can we do with that? Well, now if I create an if statement, and I want to know whether to do the stuff that's inside of the if statement or not, is it supposed to be executed or is it supposed to be skipped? I can put a boolean variable inside of it. If x, okay. So what this basically means is, if x happens to be true, then do the stuff that's inside of it. What, what if x happens to be false? You know, what if uh, at this point in the program, the x variable has false inside of it? Or maybe we were evaluating a different variable. Maybe we were evaluating y, and y happens to have false inside of it. In that case, this whole thing is skipped. These whole braces are skipped at that point. So let's learn a little bit more about these uh, Boolean variables. You can put true in it, and you can put false in it. How can I make some more useful expressions that tell me whether something is true or not true? Well, let's examine some logical operators. Logical operators. These are operators that answer us questions about our variables. Sometimes you have a variable, like variable number, and it has some number inside of it. Who knows what that number is? It could be 10, it could be 100, it could be anything. And at certain points in your program, you need to know whether, you know, whether the person's score is higher than the high score, so that you know that you beat a new high score, or whether your age is more than 18 or not. Let's not get into why you might need, you might need that. Um, or you need to know if a person has been, uh, you know, using the website for more than two hours or not. You need to ask whether a number is a certain amount, is it too high, is it too low, or is it equal to something? And in that case, we use logical operators. You can ask things like, is number greater than 100? So I'm using the greater than operator. This is the right uh, angle, uh, uh, yeah, the right angle bracket. Um, it's exactly what you guys have been using when creating your HTML tags. It's the closing HTML tag angle bracket. And what it means is greater than. What is greater than? Greater than asks you for two expressions. You need to give it, you need to feed it with two different things, one on its right side and one on its left side. And what it's going to answer you is whether the thing on its left side is more than the thing on its right side. So in this case, it's going to go to the number box and see whether whatever value is inside of the number box, is it more than whatever you put to the right side of it? So in this case, it's going to check whether 10 is more than 100. Now remember what we learned about expressions. Expressions is anything that yields a value. We just demonstrated another kind of expression that you can make. You can create var x equals true. Just like when you wrote something like var whatever equals 40, so you put the value of 40 inside of this variable xxx, now we took the value of true and we put it into this variable of x. True is an expression. It yields to us the answer. It gives us the value of true. Um, that's an expression. You can do all sorts of things with an expression. You can put it inside of a variable. And in this case, for example, when you use the greater than operator, it is also an expression. It gives us an answer. It gives us a result. All of this, if you can imagine it like something that we put in a parentheses the other time when we did like something plus something times something, right? And we put all that in a parentheses and we said, whatever comes out of this, you can do other things with it. You can put it in a variable. You can do other math with it. In this case as well, all of this gives us a certain result. Number more than 100 gives us an answer. And that answer is a Boolean answer. It gives us a result of true or false. If number is greater than 100, the result is going to be true. If number is not greater than 100, then the result is going to be false. And we can, for example, put that in a variable, like var what is the answer equals put inside of this variable whatever comes out of this evaluation. Uh, let's go quickly through a few other things you can do. You can do whether number is less than 100, right? Less than. Let's do a few more. We can do greater than or equals. Let's 
So sometimes in programming, you want to know whether a certain number exactly matches or is greater than a certain number, or the opposite, whether it's less than or equals. And I'll, I'll demonstrate an example of that in just a minute. Uh, this will probably make sense if we do our most basic uh, comparison logical app operator, which is, uh, let's say, var. Oh, these all have the same name. We're redeclaring the same variable over and over and over again. Two, three, four. And as a good programmer, our first variable is going to be number zero. Hey, I see a good candidate here for a bunch of variables we should be putting inside of an array because these are all similar variables and there's no reason to have separate individually named variables for that, we should put these all into an array. So that's a good example of that. But for now, I'm just gonna be a bit lazy and just leave it as it is for now. So the first uh, kind of thing that makes a lot of sense to be doing is whether number equals 100, okay? So you're checking whether the number actually matches this value of 100 equals. Now, very important uh, notice over here. And this notice is futile because it's not gonna help. <laughs> you guys are still going to do this bug. We've all been there, done that. This is going to happen many, many times, mark my words. This operator is typed by two equal symbols, equals, equals. And it's different than we do when you do the assignment operator, which is a single equal symbol. But we keep forgetting that. We programmers keep doing silly things like assigning one thing to another thing and thinking it means, oh, I'm just checking to see whether this is equals to that. But the programming language is very specific and is very exact and it says, what do you wanna do? Do you wanna assign this to that? Or do you wanna check whether this is equals to that? And in algebra, you have this thing where you have, right? You have like, either you test whether things are equals or if you put a slash in the middle of it, right? That means they're not equals or something like that. So in programming, the way they write that is, the equals equals symbol, double equals, will test whether number is equals to 100. So in this case, um, oh, let's add one more over here. We can test whether two things are equal, whether they're greater than the other, whether they're less than the other, whether then they're greater or equals, or whether they're less than or equals. And there's one more thing that we can do, whether they are not equals. not equals. So uh, let's say, let's say if we just uh, think about this in a shallow way and we just say, oh, var age equals some sort of age. And then I have a question whether age is over 18. Okay. So, right. This seems simple enough. This seems innocent enough. I just want to check whether age is over 18, right? Well, guess what? All of the 18 year olds are not going to be able to use this because 18 is not over 18. 18 equals 18. What you probably really meant to check was whether age is more than or equals to 18. You wanna check whether someone is 18 and up. That's what this idea of more than or equals or less than or equals is. You wanna check whether a number is something and upwards or something and downwards. So when you have a certain number, you want it to start from that number inclusive, then you might use the greater than or equals operator or less than or equals operator. Otherwise, whether you really wanna be over a certain limit, like let's say, I wanna make sure they are over 17. Okay, great, then that'll work for you. So depending on your situation, either you might use the greater than or you might use the greater than or equals. Is you gonna use the less than or less than or equals? So uh, can you guys tell me in the chat room, in the order of what is the answer zero, what is the answer one, what is the answer two, what is the answer three, what is the answer four, what is the answer five? Um, what are the answers going to be? If number over here was declared right over here, this is what number is equals, and now I'm checking whether number is equals to 100, is number greater than 100, is number less than 100, is number greater than or equals to 100, is it less than or equals to 100, and is it not equals 100? Please type into the chat. Uh, what is, what are your answers? Uh, I think if you type shift enter, you'll be able to put multiple answers on multiple different rows, but I'm not sure if that actually works. It could be that you have to type, um, I'll let you guys figure it out. Here, someone put commas. False, false, true, 
false, true, true. Okay, false, false, true, false, true, true. Correct, very good. Next. Um, someone is asking whether equals and then followed by the angle bracket symbol works. No, that does not work. It has to be in this specific order. Greater than equals, less than equals, not the other way around. Actually, the equals followed by angle symbol is another interesting operator that we're going to be using down the line with something called functions, especially the new and improved JavaScript functions that are called um, lambdas or uh, inline functions or I forgot what it's called. It's called the arrow operator or something like that when you create inline functions, lambda functions. So that's something else that has another meaning. Um, someone else answered three and five. Okay, that's a good concise way how to express it. Number three and number five are true and all the rest are false, correct. So you're getting the idea of making comparisons over here. So by doing things like asking these quest questions, whether something is true or whether something is not true, and you get an answer like false or true, a Boolean answer, that's an example of something you can use in an if statement. When you create an if statement and you want to evaluate if the age is more or equals to 18, then et cetera, et cetera, whatever code goes on over here, else whatever goes on over here, you know? So uh, in the top one, you're gonna have the more uh, grown up section and the lower one, you're gonna have the more kids section or whatever, because you're asking the question, Whatever age the guy is, however it is that we got that age, maybe we got that out of a prompt, maybe we calculated it out of someone's uh, date of birth, whatever it is, however we got the variable age, we're now checking to see, evaluate this expression, the number 18, evaluate this other expression, whatever is inside of age, and now compare them and see if this one is greater or equals to that one, and give me the answer out of that. Is it Boolean true or Boolean false? If it's true, then we do whatever is in these braces. And if it's false, then we do whatever is in the other braces. If you want, you can have an else section. If you don't want, you don't need to have an else section. You can just have the if section and that's enough. And this is one important way how we can progress with making our number guessing game. Because at some point in our program, we have to ask, did the guy guess the correct number? Did he guess something that is too high? did he guess something that's too low? And based on that, I can alert out to the user a response such as, oh, you guessed correctly, or you guessed too high, guess lower, or you guessed too low, guess higher. Let's see a quick example of how we might do this for our number guessing game. Um, here is the number uh, that I'm guessing. Okay, I'm gonna start off by splitting 10 into half, and then I'm going to alert or I'm going to say here, uh, home, here we go. Uh, try equal, oh, that's actually a programming term. So I'm gonna do try one equals prompt. As we learned from last time, I'm gonna ask, uh, um, I'm guessing number, and then I'm gonna add into there my guess. And then I'm gonna add, am I, am I, high, low, or correct. Okay, and hopefully the user is going to type either the word high, either the word low, or either the word correct. So uh, we prompted the user, the user is going to type something in and press okay, and whatever the user types in is going to go inside of this variable try one. Now I can go ahead and construct a bunch of if statements surrounding this. I can test to see if try one, similar to what we saw before with making comparison between mathematical numbers, we can also do a few kinds of um, comparisons also with text, with string. We can say something like if try one equals high, okay? If try one equals high, then I'm going to do one bunch of things. Else, if, try one equals low. Okay, then we're going to do something else. Else if 
try one equals, oh, you see, I did that bug over there. Who can find the bug over here that I'm typing? If try one equals correct. See the bug over there? To make a comparison, a logical comparison, you have to type two equal symbols. And over here, we typed only one. This is going to happen a lot. The problem is that this isn't technically an error. You're allowed to type this kind of code. You're not going to get an error that tells you, ah, oh, I know you tried to do a comparison, but instead you did the assignment operator. You're not going to get that warning. It's going to proceed to assign the value correct into the variable try one. That's going to evaluate to an expression. The expression is going to seem like it's true. And this is going to just go ahead and execute, even if you didn't mean it to. This is a particularly sneaky bug that happens a lot of the times, and it's important to keep an eye out for. When it happens to you, you'll know. Um, so over here, we might alert something like, yay, I won, because we actually guessed the number correctly. Now, if the user claims that we guessed too high, then we're, maybe we're going to adjust our guess variable to be maybe minus minus, or maybe to be minus equals, oops, minus equals two, and then try to guess again and ask them if that's too high or that's too low. If he told me that it's too low, then I'm gonna do the opposite. I'm gonna say, okay, so let's move up our guess minus uh, plus equals two, and then see if that maybe we'll have more luck with that next time around, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we're running out of time here. I'm going to challenge you guys in the next homework to read up on functions. This is something very fundamental and important to programming. I don't even think I can get away with not mentioning it at least a little bit next time, but I'm gonna run over it very, very in short because we have to already move on to starting to put together the website, putting together the web page that we're trying to build, going into the back end, the server side of things, et cetera, et cetera. So read up on functions go through as much of the free code camp lessons as you possibly can get your hands on, exercise them, try them, do them as much as you can. You're gonna get used to the concepts. Exercise your if statements and try to actually make the number guessing game that works, that keeps on asking you, oh, I'm guessing number five. Is it too high, too low, or correct? And if I type in a high, then the computer will correctly and logically proceed to guess, oh, okay, so I'm going to guess number two. Is that too high, too low, or correct? again and again until we actually complete the guess and it wins the round. And um, you guys are probably going to need another concept over here called loops. So you guys really need to try to look up on your loops, functions, and if statements and put together a little guessing game that successfully tries to guess your number and zones in on it. If, you know, if it didn't guess it correctly, it's gonna try a better guess and a better guess and a better guess until it guesses your number correctly. I'm going to post a bunch of information about this in the uh, chat group so you guys can join in and, and look in over there. I highly encourage everyone to please join in the chat rooms, ask questions over there. There's a lot of help going on over there. I appreciate everyone else that helps giving a hand answer questions between yourselves. And I really, really, really strongly apologize to everyone who has worked very hard putting together your code, putting together your projects. And I have not yet gotten around to looking at it. Maybe I still might. Who knows, it could happen. Don't have to lose hope just yet. And uh, yeah, have uh, good luck uh, putting together your exercise of making the guessing game, going through the free code camp courses over there, learning as much of the JavaScript stuff, stuff as you possibly can gobble up. And by the next time, we're gonna go through some more advanced topics in programming and how that all builds into making a cool website with the deals and getting the information and going to the back end, the server side, the database, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks everyone so much for joining us and looking forward to see you next time, God willing.